Hello, and welcome to the roundtable number 39. I am Gonzalo Lira, and I am joined by my two guests, Larry Johnson and John Kiriakou, and we are going to talk about all things intelligence, you know, to understand the world. And I've drawn these two gentlemen to discuss a lot of stuff about the intelligence community, and I'm particularly interested in focusing on the failures, unfortunately, of the intelligence community so far, and also something else that it's inevitable, you know, the creeping... A uh, 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 sense that the alphabet agencies are kind of like t taking over the public discourse in the West and controlling what people find out about, which is deeply disturbing. I mean, it's really third world banana republic kind of stuff. So anyway, first of all, let me uh, welcome my guest, Larry Johnson. Uh, Larry, how's it going, man? I am well. Thank you for having me. I'll from time to time I'll pop in the live camera when I'm not talking. That way I won't be robotic. But when I talk, I'll... <laughs> We'll go back to the to the picture, the scary okay, no picture. No problem. No, you look. It's a it's a handsome picture. You look great. You know, I mean, like uh, me, I, I look at me live, man. I don't look so good. So yeah, you look great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Larry, for joining us. It's always a pleasure. You know, he's a Larry's a repeated guest for those of you who are new to the show, and it's just a, a delight and a treat to have him on. John Kiriakou, how's it going, my friend? Hey, doing well. Thanks. Thanks so much for inviting me. Oh, it's my pleasure. And by the way, uh, to both my uh, for both my guests, you'll see in the in the description of the video as well as a pinned comment links to the work of these two gentlemen. You can find Larry at Sonar21.com, and you can find John at uh, Substack. His Substack link is uh, John Kiriaku, all one word dot Substack dot com, and uh, they write great stuff. It's the stuff that you have to read. And John, I'm going to start with you. You were telling me before the show started about something that the CIA is doing. Something yeah. naughty, you know, so they're going to be on the naughty list for, well, for next Christmas They're, they're well. going to be on the naughty list, yes. The CIA announced, get this, two years ago that they were opening a new lab. But when they announced it, nobody paid any attention. Nobody covered it. And just in the last week or two, it started making the rounds on social media. So they've opened this lab, which they say is going to be, it's called CIA Labs, plural. And okay. it's part of the U.S. government's network of 300 labs that, you know, are set up all around the world. God knows what they're going to do. But they say, you know, they're they're going to uh, develop cutting edge technology to keep the country safe. And they're going to be a leader in artificial intelligence and in quantum computing and biotechnology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there was a statement by the CIA's deputy director for science and technology um, that this is going to be so great for everybody and um, it's it's best for science and and everybody's going to be happy and everybody is going to be safer because of it and all kinds of nonsense. The, the guitar, they, to sing Kumbaya. Exactly. I mean, is that kind of thing? Exactly. Okay. And so none of that's true. None of that's true. And, and let's begin at the beginning. Uh, the truth is that the CIA has had labs for well over a half a century and mm -hmm. those labs no, but, sorry, sorry but these are because they're nowadays they use the lab for all kinds of stuff these are biomedical research labs correct. is that correct? correct and what the hell are they developing in this particular new cia lab that they're talking well about? the new cia lab they won't tell us we're just oh to, of course yeah we're supposed to take their word for it that it's it's all for the for the betterment of mankind yeah, um, of course, because the CIA has such a new <laughs> stellar track record in that regard. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. But, you know, they talk in these generalities like AI. And I, I say in this piece that I just did for Consortium News, it was published this morning and I put it on Substack. I say on my very first day at the CIA, uh, my boss, my new boss was taking me to lunch. I didn't know where the cafeteria was, so I was walking with him to go to lunch. And I noticed as we were passing a window, I noticed some movement uh, outside the window. And it was this, this thing that looks like a, like a short, round robot. And it was, it was mowing the lawn. And I said, oh, what is that? That looks like a robot. And my boss said, oh, uh, you know, here at the CIA, we have a lot of labs and scientific facilities and we develop these uh, new technologies and we develop this thing and we just don't know what to do with it so they trained it to mow the lawn well it was the predecessor of the Roomba which nobody knows was actually 
CIA, uh, it was a CIA invention using taxpayer money that now vacuums the floor of your house, right? Okay. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay, CIA, this isn't like DARPA that's, that's going to do something good for humanity. Right, right. But what okay. the CIA has done over the years, the most obvious example uh, is something called MKUltra, which I think most Americans are familiar with, where they, uh, they dosed unwitting Americans, including their own employees and contractors with LSD, just to see how they would react. Now, the, the purpose of, of doing that at the time was, well, we wanted to um, we wanted to see if LSD was a viable weapon that we could use against the Soviet Union or against Soviet bloc countries. Because what we really wanted to see is if we dosed people with LSD, would they speak freely about classified information that they had access to? Um, it was a disaster and we knew that it was a disaster. So it sort of morphed into experimentation in mind control. They got away from LSD and started using all different <clears throat> kinds of drugs. I list several of them in the piece. Drugs most of us have never heard of. I, I never heard of them, you know, except for mescaline, which they also used in experimentation. But there were, there were other programs at other labs, things like MK Chitwit, uh, MK Ultra, uh, I mentioned a second ago, MK Often, uh, Project Midnight something or other. Uh, they would do things like the CIA. Uh, yeah, it, it does all kinds of crazy ass stuff. But like specifically th this revelation now that's coming out now, wh wh yeah. what's the upshot? I mean, it, it, what's the thing yeah. that, that has you like, whoa, whoa, Nelly, what's going on here? What's the thing that, that sparked your 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 antenna, if you will. It's the CIA's track record. You know, we, we hear so much already about what DARPA is doing, uh, right. coming up with, um, for example, lasers that we would use on the battlefield to blind uh, fighters on the other side. That's actually a war crime. It, you, you can't do that. It's a violation of international law. That hasn't stopped us from developing the weapons. So rather than to shoot people or kill them, we, we uh, fire lasers at them and, um, and they go blind permanently, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, well, what's to stop the CIA from participating in something like that? There's no law, no rule. There's no, there's no announcement from the congressional oversight committees that they can't do something like that. And when they come right out and say that they're now involved in artificial intelligence and biotechnology and working with with these other governmental agencies like DARPA and NSA, or working with um, with classified defense contractors in this new lab uh, that has no civilian oversight, no public oversight, and only the the big four of the two congressional committees, the chairman and vice chairman of the House and Senate committees, have access to the information. Well, that's, so, that's uh, not basically good. an uh, autonomous lab that's going to develop all kinds of crazy ass stuff and nobody's going to yeah. know what nobody's, it is or how much know. money is being spent on it. You're exactly Larry, right. uh, you, you know, I want to pull in Larry uh, for this. I mean, what see the thing that has me like freaked out at this point, to tell you the truth, is the fact that a lot of the alphabet a agencies are going head ha have been shown now to be manipulating social media platforms and directly participating. We, we, we know about the FBI, but uh, I'm ass assuming the CIA has something analogous to what the FBI was doing insofar as propaganda efforts and so forth. Can we even say, Larry, at this point that we have like a democracy? I mean, can we say that the CIA, the intelligence community in the United States is really just part of a, a, a political, a socio-political academic financial class that does not care about the people anymore. I mean, help me out here. Yeah, no, that yeah. The, the short answer is yes. Before we do that, I, I had a question for John. Uh, so, were you going to lunch in the unclass or the class classified cafeteria? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, it was in the classified cafeteria. The, oh, okay. The CIA used to have two different cafeterias: <laughs> one for classified conversations and one for unclassified conversations. Um, you had to take 
people like from the State Department or from outside to the unclassified cafeteria, which was really tiny and not very nice, they ended up turning that into an event space. And now everybody has to go to the classified cafeteria. You know, oh, listening boy. to you guys talk about this, you know, it's like two guys from the same high school talking about the cafeteria there, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the food was garbage. And remember, you know, Mrs. Smith, who, who made the best cupcakes or whatever? I mean, it sounds like that. But anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just. Like, no, can I can I add something? I don't mean to get too far afield. Sure. But you know, uh, part of or one of the problems of the cafeteria was uh, on the morning that Mireille Malkanzi opened fire at the red light in front of the CIA and and killed two CIA employees and wounded I think it was six others. Uh, you know, the CIA kind of went crazy trying to uh, find him and to to track down his background. It turns out that his roommate worked for Dunkin' Donuts and his roommate had access to the CIA to deliver donuts every day to the CIA cafeteria. <laughs> okay. How does something like that happen? Like, is everybody yeah. asleep at the switch? Well, that, yeah. that's a good question that you can ask. Sorry, sorry I, I changed places. And I know I look like the Prince of Darkness now uh, <laughs> because I have like this little terrace in my apartment where I can like uh, smoke because I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm in a war zone, man. I mean, give me something, you know. But anyway, no, um, uh, uh, about that, about the, the failures to anticipate like obvious things. Because look, this is the thing that pisses me off about the intelligence uh, uh, communities in the West that they do not seem to be able to anticipate what is obvious to everybody else of, of things that are coming and reactions that are going to come because of certain actions done by Western governments. Why, why are the intelligence communities all failing in the West? Why are they unable to provide intelligent analysis that can actually help the democratic nations of the West make wise decisions? I'm well, throwing the, it out to both of you. Yeah, the, the, sim the simple answer is <clears throat> it's a bureaucracy. And the bureaucracy with all of the bureaucratic incentives, which are uh, run counter to the sort of what I'll call the curiosity, intellectual incentives that one would associate with in good intelligence analysis. So, uh, and let me go back to your first question about the, the influence on Twitter. This really isn't new. Remember that there was an age when the CIA was infiltrating the regular media with human beings and doing it the old fashioned way when the, in the yeah. era when they were using typewriters. So this is not new. It's, it's just it's a continuation. It's an expansion. But the, the, the bureaucratic element that's out there at CIA, and I'll, I'll be curious to see what John, if John's experience was the same as mine, the Hollywood image, the popular literature image, is of CIA with these highly intelligent people and with the enormous background and experience and depth. And morality. Well, you know, Jack Ryan, he's supposed to be a poster boy for the CIA, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. The, um, the, setting the morality issues aside, uh -huh. uh, I go back to my experience when I walked into the Middle America Caribbean Division in the fall of 1986. And I was in the Central American branch. So right, right away, I'm giving you the bureaucratic structure. So you have this uh, branch, and then you have a division, and then a or a, an office, the Middle America uh, Caribbean division, and then, then the office of Africa Latin American Affairs. So it's you know it's very hierarchical. And so in in my office, there was a Honduras analyst, me. There was an analyst for Panama. There were uh, two analysts, three working on Salvador, because Salvador was a big priority for the United States. Uh, Nicaragua had its own branch where John and, John and I have a mutual friend, Fulton, who was the, yep. uh, the chief analyst over there. And out of all of these analysts, here we are in Central America branch. I was the only one that spoke Spanish and spoke it at a level four. Yeah. I was the only one that had actually lived in Central America. So you've got people that are supposed to have this expertise and depth and they don't. They come in and they get, the, you know, start piling the message traffic in front of them. Then there's no incentive to report anything from the press or anything that's unclassified. Mm -hmm. the, it, unless you're using 
classified material, then your work as an analyst is considered inferior. So that's one of the reasons why I, I, I sort of feel liberated these days because I can go on the internet and get access to really better information than what I was getting on the inside when I had, I had access to classified information up until about three years ago. So it's just uh, the, the combination of that, if you would call it the lack of expertise, the incentives to promote people. Um, I, I, give, I give you my own personal experience what happened to me. I had a new branch chief, a woman named Mary McCarthy. She'd been, she came out yeah. of Africa, and John yeah. knows her. It very well. Um, so um, unbeknownst to me, uh, we were asked to provide the front office, and this was in the days we just got computers, but we're still using hard copy pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. So we were asked to provide the front office the top 10, 15 cables, you know, human reports, State Department reports, DOD, anything that they should pay attention to. So I'd go through and call it and send it up to the to the front office. And I did that. That, that went on for two months. Came time to get promoted. I get called in to the deputy uh, director's office in that branch, Carmen Medina. You remember Karma? Carmen. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I'm uh, still Facebook friends with her. Oh, my God. I think. I'm not. So <laughs> she... She sits me down and she just says, well, you didn't get promoted because, and listen to this, we had questions about the integrity of your analysis. And my, my eyes did one of those, you know, Roger Rabbit things where the eyeballs poke out and the steam <laughs> comes out of the ears. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? Well, it turned out that unbeknownst to me, Mary McCarthy, who didn't speak Spanish, who had never served in Central America, who had no background in it whatsoever, she was picking out her own group of cables every day, sending it forward to the front office. And for two months, the front office was getting one stack from me, which was ra radically different from what she was doing, because what she was sending up was horseshit. Mm -hmm. She had she was sending the propaganda and the crap that was coming from the field. Mm. My point is, the first day that happened, any competent manager should have called us both in and said, what the hell's going on? Mary, why are you sending this? And Larry, why doesn't yours match? No, they let it go on for two months. And then we had questions about your integrity. And so that's why we didn't report uh, promote you. That was I mean, when I knew I had to get the fuck out of that place. That there was. Uh, 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 let me ask you something. When they say that we question your integrity, are they saying that you're a traitor? Or yeah, no, they're saying I lied. That, that I was lie? shading the that I was lying and shading the intelligence. Jesus. Yeah. I, I, so that I, and this was that was Carmen Medina and Kate Hall. So yeah, I'll call them out. That 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 well, kind why of. Would, I mean, I, th this is really fascinating. Why would anybody assume? That you're lying. I mean, you you, you are an American, uh, uh, Larry Johnson. Sorry, that doesn't sound like Honduran to me. Okay, so yeah. the notion that you're lying, what what reason would you have to lie? Why? Would, oh, it's just why well, a that? political reason that I that I wanted yeah. to I wanted to make things look better for the Contras, or I wanted to make things look worse for the Contras. The reality was, my analysis was pointing out that there was not a lot of support in Honduras in particular for maintaining the Contra presence there at the time. And therefore, what I was pushing from an analytical line was going against what the Directorate of Operations was supporting. So it was creating a political conflict for the branch because then it re they were getting messages back from the White House and other places about why aren't, why aren't you people being team players? So this notion of being a team player is you support the policy. So, but the fact that they had questions about that for me was on the very first day or the second day they had questions, they should have called us both in, confronted us with it and said, what's going on? At which point I would have been able to explain that she didn't know what, that my branch chief, Mary, didn't know what she was talking about because she did not have the experience. Just because mm -hmm. she'd been at CIA longer than me didn't mean that she had actual substantive knowledge about the area and particularly about the intel. Well, what's fascinating about this that you're, that you're describing, Larry, is that, of course, this happened in Honduras in the 80s. 
But right. we got to expand it to the entire world insofar as the CIA is concerned, because the world is the purview of the global American empire. And you know, realize that in all of these, this analysis, some sort of similar kind of incompetence is going on. And therefore, the intelligence that is being reported by the CIA to decision makers is completely, number one, wrong. And then it starts to become it, 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 the policy drives the intelligence that's provided as opposed to the intelligence mm -hmm. providing a true picture of the reality on the ground. W would that be correct, John? Yeah, I think I think you've hit it on the head. And I think everything that Larry said is is also right on. This is an ongoing theme in in the uh, in the CIA. It's not it's not just in operations, as Larry says, it's also prevalent in analysis, too. You know, the pr part of the problem of the CIA is is everybody thinks that he or she is the smartest person in the room. And there's nothing that anybody can tell them that is going to that's going to change their mind or that's going to teach them something new. And like Larry correctly said, if somebody has been there longer and they went to, you know, some great school, uh, they just automatically think that they're smarter than you are, even though you're the substantive expert on these kinds of things. You happen to be younger and more junior in the hierarchy but they just think that they're smarter than you. And if they don't like your analysis, they're going to go around you, whether it's to the office director or to the president of the United States or to somebody in between. That happens every single day at the CIA. And I'll add, too, that, you know, we criticize uh, the CIA's operational elements a lot. Right. They've they've fallen on their face a million times. Uh, we know what happened uh, uh, up until 1975, thanks to the Church Committee. But what we often don't focus on is the CIA's analytic failures. If somebody were to go back and take a look at all of the major world events from the creation of the CIA with the National Security Act of 1947 onward, I think we would learn that the CIA missed every major world event analytically. They either missed it completely or they got it wrong, whether it was, you know, the the Berlin airlift, the events surrounding the Berlin airlift or the Suez crisis in 56 or the the six day war or whatever, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the Iranian hostage crisis. You name the major world event and I guarantee to you that the CIA got it wrong. Yeah. Is it, is it almost like, you know, that whenever the CIA says left, you have to turn right? I think so. Well, what do you think, Larry? So one of the things that's happened, um, it, it's, it's been an evolution. When the CIA was first set up, you did have a separation, strong separation between the operations side of the house and the analytical side of the house. And uh, part of that was the, under, you know, the, I think the, the ops people understood that they would be in a position to manipulate uh, the analytical side. And they literally had doors that in the in the first CIA headquarters constructed out in McLean, Virginia, they had doors in the middle of the building that would separate people from operations and analysis. So you were you were literally physically kept apart. Then somewhere, I think it was late 70s, early 80s, they opened the doors. So now there was interaction and exchange. Uh, what I experienced uh, as the you know, I, I, I did a stint on the ops side in the Central American Task Force. Mm -hmm. So I had connections and ties with people there. But then I became the Honduran analyst and Honduras is functioning at the time as the aircraft carrier for the Contras, you know, a land-based aircraft carrier. And um, the pressure that was coming, the, the ops people, when they get involved with covert action, and when I'm referring to covert action, let's say arming, training, equipping the Contras, helping them carry out um, military attacks in Nicaragua and other places. Those officers who are invested in that, their, their success depends upon the success of what's happening on the ground. So therefore, they're going to do everything in their power to make sure that that looks as good as possible, mm -hmm. even up to and including lying. Sure. And I had the experience once where we were reading about the, the, the op side was issuing uh, the, T, uh, the it's called TD. It's a human report. 
And the human report was a, was detailing an attack that the Contras had allegedly take, carried out. But we had no other co corresponding evidence of it, no overhead imagery, no uh, in, uh, intercepts. What happened was uh, the guy who was running the program, first name by uh, John, he was a he was a frustrated West Point. He graduated from West Point in 67. And what he was doing was he was actually writing out himself the operations orders for the Contras, mm -hmm. sending it down to them. And then at the appointed date and time, he would issue it as if it had actually happened, even though it hadn't happened. Okay? So... <laughs> By the way, this, this lends itself to all kinds of corruption. Where this John, you think? For instance, you uh, think? I, okay, so, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, yeah, not, a, I, I, I'm not intelligence, man. I'm, I'm just a regular dummy. So, so, so basically, yeah. It, was he skimming off the top in particular in, the, in, in this issue? In this, no, he in just, this? you know, it, it had it, when you come up for your annual report, you got to be able to show your fitness report. The the PAR, as it's called, you got to be able to have some, you know, you do, you get to cite all these accomplishments that you carried out, even though they may not have actually happened. Now, that was 30 years ago, okay? Uh, actually, almost 40 years ago. So, and you know, it's what has happened, years. what's happened since then, it's gotten worse because now they've created these centers where the analysts and the operators are share the same space. So, right now, I would like you to imagine that you are a Russian analyst and you're sitting in this task force that's been set up to monitor the events in Ukraine. How do you think it's going to go over if you come in and say the reality is the Russians felt compelled to launch this military operation because of what the United States and NATO was doing with respect to expanding NATO to Ukraine? Do you think you'd be allowed to say that? No. Would you be allowed to write that? No, because it goes against the, the this policy decision to send complete military and intelligence support to Ukraine, regardless of what the facts are on the ground. Uh, yeah, when when not. Larry and I were were analysts, um, there was a Chinese wall between analysis and operations. Uh, there was a period where um, you know we had to be buzzed in to the operational. Uh, offices, yeah. right? We we didn't have the ability to just walk around freely around the building. Um, I think it was actually better back in those days because, as Larry says uh, correctly, we've got these centers now where everybody's sitting together: the operations people, the in, the analysis people, the science and tech people. There are a couple of FBI agents. There's an NSA rep. There's some guy from you know Customs and Border Protection or whatever. Everybody's sitting together in these in these centers, and then groupthink sets in. So if you're an analyst and your job is to prevent to present rather um, a completely independent view based on your reading of the intelligence. But then the people you're sitting around are saying, no, 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 you're getting it wrong. Uh, even if you're not, uh, we need to protect these these uh, operational equities or you can't say that because they're, they're going to be pissed off at the White House at the NSC. So you have to change it to this. Well, then you've got this completely mucked up analysis that's wrong and is not what you intended in the first place. And you're only you're only presenting it because it's going to keep everybody in your silly center uh, happy. Well, that's not, that's not service to the country. That's not public service. That's just going along to get along. And yeah. that's what leads to intelligence failure after intelligence failure. Yeah, because it, it, to talk about the specific situation in Ukraine, you know, I mean, uh, what Larry was saying that, yeah, no analyst is going to tell the truth. And, and so how are... How is the public at large and decision makers in particular going to make the right decisions? Because what's what's obvious to everybody who's in the alt commentariat community, if you will, the YouTube, you know, the, the, this little um, circle of people who are watching this like like it's a Mexican soap opera, right? Uh, you know, we are getting the correct information because we are predicting things that are going to happen correctly. Whereas in the West, they they are just out to lunch. I mean, like, I remember uh, uh, before when the conflict first started, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, in the financial community. 
and, and he's a pretty sharp customer and very well informed. And he said, these sanctions aren't going to do anything to Russia. They will probably hurt the West. Mm -hmm. And and of course, the decision makers went full throttle on the sanctions. And exactly what he, the guy said, the guy works at an investment bank and his job was to now analyze this stuff. But his job was to present realistic analysis. Whereas the CIA, the, the publicly funded intelligence agencies seem to be completely off base, you know? I mean, yeah. wouldn't it be better yeah. to just shut down the CIA and, and just follow the Duran and a few other channels? Well, I think mind. Larry and I have both have both advocated that. Yeah, <laughs> you, yes. You know, can, can I add something too? I, I, I did an analysis one time, I was a junior analyst and I did an analysis on, um, on a popular uprising in Bahrain. And I said, I believed that the Bahraini royal family would muddle through. They would give the opposition just enough to calm them down without giving them any real freedom. And they would muddle through. That, that ended up being what happened. But I was, I was taking a task over that analysis. And I was told that I needed to start thinking outside the box. I freaking hate that <laughs> phrase, first of all. I need to think out of box, out of the box. And I said to my boss, I said, listen, you got to make stuff up. up. That's what yeah. it means. Well, well, you took the words out of my mouth. I said to my boss, there's a difference between doing thoughtful analysis and just making shit up. Yeah. And you want me to just make shit up. Yeah. And I can't do that. But uh, that happens every single day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, well, and by the way, I just want to mention the fact that we're, we've crossed the 3,500 uh, mark in so far as concurrent viewers. And I'm urging all of my viewers who are interested in Larry and John to check out their links. They're in the description below and as a pinned comment. And I just want to like, you know, uh, throw that out there so that uh, everybody knows where they can find them. But anyway, John, I'm sorry, well, I cut you off. Or, no, no, you didn't. No, yeah, Go ahead. You, you were cut. Yeah, you're cutting me off. I'm upset. No. Uh, oh, so. man. You know, it, it must be my Larry, Larry phobia because everything is a phobia now. There's transphobia, yeah. there's the, <laughs> dysphobia, that phobia. It's Larry phobia. Well, you know, you know there, 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 are, there, there are a couple of other changes that have taken place. So let's call it sort of institutionally or and, yeah. and procedurally. So the, the phenomena that John and I are describing of political influence over the intelligence analysis process is not new. Uh, I, I was fortunate that I was uh, taught in the new analyst course by an old analyst by the name of George Allen. Wow. George Allen was the division chief over the Vietnam War, and he was the one who had an analyst by the name of Sam Adams, mm -hmm. literally a descendant of uh, Sam Adams. And the, the advantage that Sam Adams had as an analyst was he had lived in Vietnam, he knew the terrain, but he was also wealthy. He was a multimillionaire. So he had what is called fuck you money. So there, because mm -hmm. they couldn't threaten, if they threatened him with loss of his job, no big deal. He was going to survive and be able to feed his family. And what George Allen described to, to us, my class, there were about uh, 12 of us in there. He described what it was like. He was getting phone calls from Lyndon Baines Johnson, from Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense. He was getting from the National Security Advisor. And the, the, it was over and over this pressure. Why don't you be a team player? You know, why aren't you, why are you saying that the, the, the Viet Cong have all of this uh, extra forces when we've killed them all? And, you know, that was sort of the, the basic issue. And he, and he told us, he said, I regret that I didn't push back harder. He said, because at the time I had two kids, one was in high school, one was starting college. I didn't have any money to fall back on. So he was basically a hostage to his economic situation, unable to tell the truth about what was going on. The other change right. that's taking place is back in that era in the 60s and 70s, the CIA still had a very good human ability where our case officers go overseas and persuade foreigners to come to work for us and to spy for us and to give us information and betray their own countries. What has happened uh, started in the late 90s, accelerated into the 2000s, over-reliance on liaison reporting where our yes. intelligence comes from a foreign intelligence service and it just gets passed to us and then we put it out, which is why What's going on with a lot of the so-called analysis right now with respect to Ukraine 
It's mm -hmm. coming from the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Whatever the Ukrainians tell us, these analysts are repeating. And they're not, they're not even going out to challenge it critically. So that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that that's is part absolutely of, correct. Absolutely yeah. correct. You know, I, I worked for a, a CIA deputy director. It was my last headquarters job. I was his executive assistant. And he used to say all the time that the job of the CIA is actually quite simple. It's to recruit spies, to steal secrets, and then to analyze those secrets to allow our policymakers to make the best informed policy. And on paper, that's perfect. That's exactly what the CIA should be doing. But in reality, the CIA has never done that. Never. Yeah. They've done things like, you know, uh, uh, smuggle uh, Nazi war criminals into the country or to infiltrate U.S. media organizations uh, or to, uh, to, to drug people, as we said at the start of the show, just to see how they react. Or, uh, you know, rather than developing sources... And, it, and let me tell you, it's hard work. I spent eight years in operations. It's hard to convince somebody to commit espionage for you yeah. or to commit treason for you yeah. just because you're a nice guy and they enjoy your company and you're going to pay them a lot of money in the end. But it's hard work. Well, it's not hard work to drive to the Ukrainian intelligence service every morning and say, what do you got for me today? <laughs> and then you go back to the station and you type it into the CIA's computer system and say, here's a liaison report, which then the White House or the Pentagon or the CIA promptly leaks to the New York Times or the Washington Post to make it look like the Ukrainians are going to win this war. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because they're, they're not winning. It's, it's catastrophic, quite frankly. Right. I, I want to ask you something uh, to, to flip the coin, if you will. Do you think that similar problems are befalling the Russians or the Chinese, for that matter? Or do you think that they have organized their intelligence services in a, in a more rational sense to order, in order to get a better sense of reality? I think the Chinese, because of the, the money that they have, um, you know, they don't spend their money like we do on, on ridiculously expensive uh, defense projects. They, they have a lot of um, free cash flow. And right. so they've coupled the collection of human intelligence with electronic collection of intelligence. Um, the Russians do it the old fashioned way. They recruit human sources to, to give them information. Um, it's something that we've gotten away from in a, in a really bad way. Now, with that said, and I'll, I'll repeat myself, uh, I'm on record as saying that I don't think we should have a CIA. Not that a CIA wouldn't be valuable if it could be trusted and, and successfully and efficiently overseen by, by uh, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, but it's proven over the course of 75 years that it can't be trusted to do that. And yeah. so, you know, we've got the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, for example, that does fantastic analysis. We yeah. have uh, a, a division of, the, not a division, but a, a bureau of the Department of Defense called Defense Human Services that does exactly what CIA operations does. It, it develops human sources. We've got NSA that does electronic uh, intelligence collection. We've got DARPA that does all the experimentation and the scientific uh, uh, and technological advancements. There's there's no reason to have this out of control uh, body called the CIA. It, it's it's doing the American people a disservice. Yeah, no, but I, I when I refer to the Russian intelligence services and the Chinese intelligence services, what I'm interested in, in knowing is, are they providing their leadership, their respective leaderships, with accurate information, uh, with an uh, accurate analysis of, of the of the of the ground situation? Because it seems to me that what's going on with the CIA and, and Western intelligence services generally is that they are providing the leadership class with a completely distorted view of reality. And yeah. so they keep, they keep constantly being caught flat-footed. They, they, mm -hmm. They're like, how did this happen? We were winning. Like, for instance, <clears throat> in this situation here, there mm -hmm. is inevitably going to be a moment of collapse of the Zelensky regime. It's, it's on the horizon. And everybody in Washington is going to be like, what happened? Well, you know, like, well, they did, it, they did the same with that. I mean, the same thing happened with Afghanistan, for heaven's sake. OK, mm -hmm. just two mm -hmm. years ago. So what what you're seeing is we we've witnessed a complete role reversal. 
what the Soviet Union used to be, the United States is. Mm. What the United States used to be, Russia is becoming. Yeah. And what I mean by that is in the Soviet era, the, the, the party politics and the, 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 know, the need to sort of tell people up on top what they wanted to hear was very, very strong. And that when you have a very centralized system, it, in, it inevitably it caters or panders to the person at the top. Uh, and by contrast, the more decentralized it is, the more likely you are to actually get some real information. And so I think, think the, I'm sorry. I think the Russians. Are, I think the Russians are far superior to the United States on that count. And I don't. I don't think there's. There really is at this point no incentive to lie to Vladimir Putin or to Lavrov or to the the rest of the or to Gerasimov and, and the military leadership. They're because the, they recognize the survival as a nation is not stake. This we're talking existential. Good point. And yeah, with good that, point. That, that 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 sort of tends to clear clear up one's yeah, vision. Like, yeah, focuses it. You, you can't yeah. bullshit when <clears throat> when there's a real chance that you're going to be overrun. So so they have to be, and and so you think that maybe the CIA the the problem of it is that it it consider it has always considered the United States so rich and powerful that it sort of like almost doesn't matter because you know I mean things will work themselves out so it's okay if we cut corners. That kind of mentality. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would, we, we're terrible at self-reflection because if we would simply yeah. be honest with ourselves, step back and look at the record of the last 60 years from Vietnam to the, the, the futile wars in Central America to two wars in Iraq to a war in Afghanistan, this, this Pax America... In, instead of Pax Americana, it's been more like Pax Americana. Okay, <laughs> and it, it's it's been an infection upon the world. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. That's a good line. Yeah, feel free. That that was our model at CIA. Anything worth doing well is worth stealing from someone else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, the only the only place you'd ever work where plagiarism was encouraged and rewarded. You know, so oh, uh, so true. <laughs> So true. Well, and they used to call it Mervin. Yeah. Mervin. <laughs> plagiarism. You just <laughs> merv it. So it, it goes in different directions and you just claim credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like, but because the, the thing that drives me up the wall is that, see, from the seat, because it seems at this time that we have the following situation in the West where we have these intelligence services that get this information. And they have a bunch of press people that are more or less, I don't think that they're on their payroll per se, but they provide exclusive information so these various journalists can show up to their editor's office and, and say, hey, here, I got something yes. from this CIA guy, you know, Ooh, it's real intelligence stuff. And so the, the CIA is providing uh, false information because of the reasons that we discussed previously. And providing that information to the press that regurgitates it and spreads it out and propagandizes the people into believing things that are simply not true. Uh, oh, Alexander, yeah. uh, Alexander Mercurius in, in yesterday's show, and I always recommend Alexander and the Durant, they're fantastic. He mentioned mm -hmm. the fact that the Wall Street Journal, I haven't read this article, I'm just going by his account, but he's always you know, on point and, and reliable. He, he says how the Washington, uh, the, excuse me, the Wall Street Journal put out an article talking about Putin and, and basically characterizing him as, you know, uh, um, you know, Hitler in, in the in the days as as Berlin was falling, you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. issuing nonsensical orders and pacing around and being hysterical, which could not be further from the truth. I mean, yeah. because everybody's been noticing the various meetings that Putin has been running. They're very competent and very on point. And I mean, he seems to be like a man in charge in full and everybody seems to be lockstep, not fearful of him, but rather, yeah, we agree, let's go where this guy is telling us to go or leading us towards. And so the Wall Street Journal, which is supposed to be a reputable news um, uh, news site, a uh, newspaper, is spewing things that are objectively not true. And the smarter people who read the, new, uh, the Wall Street Journal are saying to themselves, well, this must be true. And it's just bullshit. And I'm like, dude, what the hell is going on with you? So my point is, do you, do you think that 
the way the system has become organized, I'm not saying that there's some cabal or something, I think it's just a natural evolution, but do you think that the way the system is currently organizing, whereby information coming, erroneous information, erroneous analysis coming from intelligence services is being passed to reporters and essentially being propagandized? Well, but is it erroneous? The option? I, I, maybe you're giving them too much credit. You know, there was a there was a thing in the in the press just a few weeks ago about uh, Russia Gate, where a Washington Post editor had emailed um, a reporter. The reporter had gotten some information from the CIA saying uh, the Russians were involved in uh, uh, getting Trump elected, and he was saying this just sounds wrong to me, yeah. and and the editor wrote back and said, um, but if anybody would know, wouldn't they know? I can't believe they would get something like this wrong. Well, it's not an issue of getting it wrong. It's that they're lying to you. Yeah. You know, there's a fantastic journalist who's now at Bloomberg. Um, uh, he used to be with, uh, oh my gosh, we started off with the LA Times. But anyway, Jason Leopold. Jason huh? Leopold has been described by a senior DOD official as a FOIA terrorist because he has made more Freedom of Information Act requests than any other person in the world, right? Really? He's uh. the one who used FOIA, for example, to break the Hillary Clinton email story. So what he did, this is about, I don't know, two or three years ago, he sent a FOIA request to the CIA asking for copies of all communications between the CIA's Office of Public Affairs and journalists, all journalists. And what he found, among other things, was a, a series of emails traded between CIA and Ken Delanian, who is the lead national security correspondent for NBC News and MSNBC. And he found that Ken Delanian was sending his articles to the CIA for clearance before he was sending them to his own editor. <laughs> and what he another thing that he found was that was that the CIA's Office of Public Affairs was warning journalists not to publish anti-CIA information or they would not be invited to the Christmas party anymore. Totally oh, oh my God, you know, yeah. I can't I'm and, not invited to so the Christmas party. Oh, let me slip my wrist. Oh my God! Yeah, and we, you know, we talk about Operation Mockingbird, for example, where until 1975 the CIA was recruiting journalists or, or placing CIA officers in journalistic outlets. They don't need to do that anymore. The the journalists now do it for free mm -hmm. because, it, first of all, most outlets don't have a budget for investigative journalism, right? And secondly, you know, the CIA is going to give you a scoop. You gist it. You put your name in the byline. You make it onto the front page. You get promoted. That's just what they do now. That's just a reality of today's media. So just yeah. a series of, of bad uh, 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 motivations, of bad incentives, misincentives, is creating this, this, uh, this situation where lies from the intelligence community are passed on to journalists who spew more lies, and it just expands the lies all over the place until the people have a completely distorted sense of reality. Is, well, is I, that basically... I, I would I would say that the, the the real flaw is as long as covert action is allowed to remain part of the CIA, it will never be able to reform itself. I, I agree with John that it probably ought to just be burned to the ground. Uh, I would start it over. I think I think there is a need for, if, if you will, a professional cadre of analysts, but yeah. in, but genuinely independent analysts. And, and the problem yeah. with, with a creature like the CIA is it's sort of like that dog you have at home that wants to go out for a walk. So the CIA eagerly waits for the treats that the White House will throw it or for the pat on the head for, boy, that was great analysis. And up until the point that you're actually pointing out that, uh, that hey, you know, you guys at the White House, you've shit the bed. Well, they don't want to hear that. You know, the, they don't want to be told that they need to go buy some Depends and put those on. Um, so the, you've always got this this tension where as long as covert action is operating, it does it's going to actually drive the attempts to recruit human sources if that's going on. 
And so you're, you're going to always have corrupted intelligence produced by the director of operations. If you're going to have a covert action capability, it needs to be walled off, be its own agency. But then that's something that, frankly, is really dangerous, because when you look at our history, as John mentioned earlier, the history of covert action is not a, one with uh, great success scattered about. No, it's nothing it's to failure be after failure or where we make the world worse off, not better off. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. You know, because I, I think to myself, you know, of, of uh, different kinds of analyses that I, I uh, that I've come across, uh, mostly financial, quite frankly. And that financial uh, that financial analysis is usually spot on. If if some financial analyst is saying, "Oh, it's more or less like this," you you can take it to the bank because money is riding on these decisions. There are consequences immediately. If an analysis uh, an analyst says, "You know, buy this bond or don't buy this bond," you know, a lot of money can be lost or won depending on the correct uh, uh, analysis, right? But insofar as the CIA and, the, and these intelligence services are concerned, there's no consequences, it seems to me. I mean, I can None. say that, that you know, uh, Vladimir Putin tomorrow is going to be replaced by a purple kangaroo as the president of the Russian Federation. I say this as an analyst at the CIA. And, you know, it proves out to be wrong, of course. And nothing oh, happens to me. I just no, but that's, but that's the reality. In, that's the reality in the CIA. For years, I worked for a guy who... Um, <laughs> who had been a Saudi analyst and then moved into management. And when he made it up to GS 14, he told a group of us that he was going to make a name for himself by saying over and over and over again to everybody who would listen that the Saudi Royal family would be overthrown. And so this became his thing. It became a joke for us, but as administrations change and, you know, new, people coming into these positions just don't know any better. This is a really powerful briefing that they get when they first win the presidential election, that the Saudi royal family is going to be overthrown. Well, he made it up into the senior intelligence service, level one, level two, level three, level four. He ends up one of the, one of the deputy directors of the CIA, even though the Saudi royal family not only was never overthrown, but is probably in a stronger position now than it ever has been in its history. Yeah. The truth never <clears throat> mattered. What mattered was he came across as a smart guy who had lived in the region and spoke Arabic, and he really passionately believed this to be true. In fact, he didn't passionately believe it to be true. He believed that it would set him apart from everybody else saying that there was no danger to the Saudi royal family, and he was the one that got promoted. Yeah, in oh, fact, so, so, if you screw oh, up, sorry. you're most likely to get promoted. You get that's rewarded, right. not punished. I mean, that's I have right. uh, one of my, uh, so in the first year I was there, I was in the career trainee program, and this this is one of the first runnings where, in the past, the career trainee program was only for future case officers, people who were going to go out and try to recruit spies. But I was in the era when they had both analysts and operations people and science and technology and admin people. So Valerie Plame, for example, was part of my class. Uh, so one of my classmates, uh, his first assignment was in Costa Rica. And what he discovered was that his the predecessor that had been there before him had recruited, supposedly recruited some agents that were uh, giving uh, information on the Sandinistas. It turned out the guy had fabricated them. Ugh. So, so my my friend, he disclosed the fabrication, pointed it out. He got a twenty thousand dollar bonus doing it. The guy that had created the false agents, he later wound up as chief of station in Romania. <laughs> oh my god! So, I, I mean, it, but that's the point. That lack of accountability. Because that's what yeah. we're really talking about here. If people are going to be held accountable for the decisions they make, if they get people killed, or if they get if they if they cause major mayhem, or give the wrong coordinates and you bomb the Chinese em embassy in Sudan, you know you, you, we can go down the list. And that was the one thing that I, I I really saw lacking out there. And I don't know what John's experience was, but the utter lack of accountability. That, that's yeah. something else that we're seeing across the board in Western society, a lack of accountability. 
You, you are completely incompetent. And what happens to you? You get kicked upstairs. Look mm -hmm. at Kamala Harris. Look at Ursula von der Leyen. She was uh, current EU uh, commissioner president. She was the right. minister of defense of Germany. And she was under disaster. And she got kicked mm -hmm. upstairs. It's almost like, you know, if you're competent, your career is cratered. But if you're an idiot, you get a better position with a better salary. How did this happen uh, in, in, the, in, in your view? That, it, uh, that 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 failure is rewarded that incompetence gets you ahead how did this happen i mean this is a genuine question and i'm asking you in so far as your expertise in the cia is concerned but i'm interested in it as a general problem that i view in the west john well <laughs> i mean it's I, it's, a, it, it's a tough problem it, it, I, it's, I, a, I it's a tough question yeah it's a tough question uh, and I think that there are several answers. One, it, it's very much an old boys club and now an old boys and girls club where yes. at the top, at that senior level, level, they're all friends and they all um, take care of one another. Now, there are some notable exceptions, of course, where personalities conflict and, and they go after each other. But for the most part, they all look out for each other at that very senior level. Um, another thing that, that I sort of came into contact with when dealing with people at that level is that they're also afraid that if somebody in a senior position becomes disgruntled, that they'll go to the media and that would be disastrously embarrassing. You know, I worked for a woman um, who had never, uh, I worked for her in operations. She had never been a case officer. She was what was called a reports officer, meaning when the case officer collected the raw intelligence, she would make sure that the formatting was correct and the source descriptor was correct and she would send it into headquarters for release. Well, in the 1980s, uh, a large group of, of female CIA operations employees filed a class action suit saying that they had been discriminated against because they were women. They had been discriminated against. And so in the Eastern District of Virginia, a judge found that they had indeed been discriminated against. He said, he said in his decision that he had never seen a defendant in a case um, so deeply document its own crime as the CIA did by, like, they, they turned over in discovery memos saying, oh, don't promote her, she's a woman. Promote the guy instead. Like, they actually wrote this down and kept it. <laughs> So, so they're supposed to be intelligence, man. Yeah. So every every woman in operations got a two grade promotion. So you go from a twelve to oh, a fourteen. Okay. That's a significant. That's a significant oh. promotion. A thirteen to a fifteen. These are very significant promotions. Well, she was one of those people that got the two grade promotion. She had never been on a covert to a covert meeting in her life. She had never recruited a spy in her life. But all of a sudden, she became the chief of the biggest station in the world. And then on the strength of that, became the deputy director of national intelligence. That kind of thing happens a lot. Where it, this it, woman, it, this it, woman, excuse, excuse the pun, she was a boob. I mean, <laughs> I, I, never, I never worked for anybody who was so cut off from the day-to-day -day life of an operations officer and frankly had no idea what the analyst did all day long. She had no idea, <laughs> nor did she care, um, who made it literally to the very top of the intelligence community. Jesus yeah. Christ. Well, what, what about our current director of CIA? Is, is, oh, uh, well, Burns. Well, yeah, I mean, Burns is, uh, he, he's sort of the worst um, from the standpoint with his heritage as a foreign service officer, um, yeah. you know, he understands, he understands the business of intelligence, but he's just, he's a political animal. And that's, that's the problem with this. You've got to try to divorce the politics. If you're going to get a real intelligence done, the politics have got to be divorced from it. I know I'm suggesting that I'm incredibly naive, but it is really, it, you need somebody that's going to tell you the truth. You yeah. know, hey, honey, do I look fat in this dress? Well, you know, <laughs> you do. Yeah, you're, you know, if you're married, you know that the correct answer to that is no. So, <laughs> or if you want to say, you look so, lovely. Yeah, that's that's an example where 
politics comes in <laughs> interferes with doing real intelligence analysis as opposed to said yeah you know you could drop a few pounds and you'd look better you know that would be the truth but you get in trouble unfortunately i i think what has allowed this uh, political corruption to take place has be been because we've not faced an existential threat in the united states since since we, we since the civil war yeah yeah uh, i mean world war one world war two korea none of those posed existential threats to us so as a result you could always get away with hiring fredo to do the bookkeeping okay and <laughs> that's right yeah i mean it's just uh it is it's the kind of thing that where you're it's not life and death because when it gets down to life and death if you look back at the founding of the the, the republic here in the in the united states that uh, those men who gathered in Philadelphia and put these documents together, um, they were, had flaws, and they were you know, far from perfect, and they allowed you know slavery. But uh, there was a level of competence among them that was extraordinary. That when you compare that with the current group of folks that inhabit Congress and the you know, the halls of the Senate or the House of Representatives. It was appalling. Uh, I was just reading the other day as an example, the, the Republicans elected a guy up in New York who yeah. lied. I mean, George claimed, Santos. You know, Santos, unbelievable. He, he, lied, he, admit, about he lied about everything. That he had he a even wrong. lied about being gay. He said that he's been openly <laughs> gay for 10 years and he was married to a woman until a year and a half ago. <laughs> Okay, that's a first. That's a first, yeah. you know. Uh, so <laughs> lying about being in the closet, that that's a first. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah so know, I, I, and they know, get away I, with I this wonder, I wonder if there's YouTube no price. Would, would, I wonder if YouTube would, would bump me in the algorithm if I claimed I was gay or maybe said I, I identify as a woman. Would that help? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. Apparently, you know, that, that's the way to go nowadays in this current in this culture. Jesus. Hey, by uh, the way, um, I'm gonna. Um, uh, we've got like 4,200 concurrent viewers. Chat, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Why don't you give our guests a plus one if you are appreciating this conversation because it's a delight as far as I'm concerned. And um, yeah, I'm gonna bring on uh, one of my longtime supporters on Patreon uh, to ask a question. And to Patreon supporters, we're gonna do a couple of questions, but please be to the point and brief, please. Thank you. Uh, JJ, how's it going, man? It's going very well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm rather late, so this may have already been covered. Um, but uh, can you talk about the stovepiping of intelligence services um, for the Iraq war and um, what happened with David Kelly? Wow. Well, who's, that... who's, David, who's David Kelly? Dr. David Kelly, who apparently, well, the story goes that he committed suicide. He was a weapons inspector that came out and said that the dossier was fake, was all sexed up, I believe was the term at the time. And uh, basically, um, he came out, said this, then he suddenly turns up dead. Um, the working theory is that it was a foreign intelligence service which I'm not going to name because I don't want to be accused of being anti-Semitic, but you can guess from that which one it was. I, I'm surprised you haven't heard of him. Yeah, yeah, I'm, but but he was not John? the only one. He wasn't the only one saying that uh, the the claims about weapons of mass destruction were false. I mean, you had right. Scott Ritter was very prominent at the time and, in fact, ended up uh, resigning, uh, uh, oh, I think, over that very issue, just that they were being ignored. So uh, it was, uh, and then, you know, what was going on at CIA, uh, my my former colleague, Valerie Plame. I mean, Valerie, I know, was honestly looking because they had all these reports coming out, but they could never verify and corroborate. And then they began to see it was complete disinformation. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I don't, I, I don't think, Kelly was necessarily so prominent that he needed to be taken out because the message was at getting out there through other means as well. John, it was it was my understanding that his his wife later said that it was a it was a suicide. With that said, um, JJ is right. Uh, 
that intelligence service has a very long track record of taking out anybody who might perhaps maybe someday pose a problem to them. Uh, they, they very proudly took credit for the Gerald Bull um, assassination back in, what was it, 1990, the spring of 1990, uh, and an untold number of Iranian um, nuclear scientists. Uh, it, it would take us hours to talk about the, the stovepiping of intelligence um, in the run-up okay. to the Iraq war. The stovepiping, can you, can you explain that, please? Yeah, you know, there was a lot of intelligence out there saying that the Iraqis just simply did not have a program to develop weapons of mass destruction. It just didn't. Right. And I remember being an observer, not a participant, but I was there as a note taker for a meeting between CIA analysts and Department of Energy analysts on what had and had not been developed on this Iraqi program. And it became a shouting match because the Department of Energy analysts kept saying, there is no evidence that the Iraqis are developing weapons of mass destruction. And I'll tell you what convinced me that they were right was that Saddam Hussein's two sons-in-law, Hussein Kemal al-Majid and Saddam Kemal al-Majid, they'd been married to Saddam's uh, two daughters, uh, uh, two of the three daughters, Rana and Ragged. Uh, they defected to Jordan, and the CIA sent a team, uh, not of operational people, but of analysts, to go out to Jordan and um, and debrief them. And one of those people was a boss of mine. He told me when he got back that as soon as they walked into the room, uh, Hussein Kamel, who had been Saddam's minister of industry and military industrialization, he was in charge of the WMD program, he said that the Iraqis destroyed all of their weapons of mass destruction after the first Gulf War because they were so afraid that Scott Ritter and his teams were going to find something that it would allow the Americans an opening to attack the country again. And so, you know, a biological weapons program you can set up in, in your kitchen. All you need is a sink and a stove and a refrigerator, and you've got a bioweapons lab. So that was easy. But the nuclear uh, program was well documented to have been uh, disabled and, and uh, destroyed well before, a decade before the Gulf War. The CW, chemical weapons program, was a little bit harder, but but Hussein Kamel said no. In in 1991 and 1992, that whole program was done away with. The CIA just chose to either not believe it or to ignore it, and then to sort of beat that drum for the next 10 years until George W. Bush became president, and he was comfortable enough allowing Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld at all to take falsified intelligence from Ahmed Chalabi and the Iraqi National Congress to, to lay this false, uh, this false premise for, for war. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, other the other element of stovepiping yeah. is that information that's kept within CIA channels is not shared with FBI, as an example. I mean, that was, really, right. the, that was really the most prominent case of the stovepiping in the lead up to 9-11. 9-11. That with information that the CIA had that was FBI agents who were detailed out to the agency were unable to share it back with uh, FBI headquarters, which, you know, may have made a difference. And uh, it was this protection. You, you know, there are lots of different theories and explanations for why that was done. But that failure to use, use compartmentation of information to prevent it from being shared where you get to see the whole picture. Well, uh, until 2003, the CIA and FBI computer systems were incompatible with one another. Right. And so if something was reported in CIA channels, the FBI had no access to it and vice versa. Finally, the, uh, the CIA named a CIA officer as deputy director of the FBI for counterterrorism. And the FBI named a senior FBI agent as, as um, deputy director of the CIA's counterterrorism center. So there was that forced cooperation. But Larry's exactly right. 
uh, stove piping in that in that example led to the deaths of thousands of, of Americans yeah. just simply because the CIA and the FBI hated each other. Yeah. And then on, on top of it, when when Edward Snowden did what he did, um, and I personally view Snowden as a hero myself. But, I do, um, too. Um, what what he did up to that point. I was scripting exercises with the uh, U.S. Military Special Operations Command, and we would have full access to CI to State Department messages. Once that happened, they went back to stovepiping. They cut off uh, all DOD personnel were cut off from the State Department message traffic. So, you, you know, it's, they keep talking. Of, it, we we do it, and then they go back to the old habits of uh, not sharing information across. Uh, you know, across uh, agencies. Agencies become very protective and parochial of their interests. Yeah. Uh, is that my, think, my thinking is that, see, like with, with what happened in 2003, <clears throat> uh, insofar as, you know, there are no weapons of mass destruction. And so, um, you know, th that comes out after the invasion has happened, but it's still during the Bush administration. And so there are no consequences to the, to the CIA mm -hmm. or the intelligence. On the contrary, because they they gave the justification for what they wanted irrespective i mean they were gonna they were gonna invade anyway and it was just uh it's some, there's some clicking going on i don't know who's mike or or somebody like a tap tapping but anyway um, there, the was, is, there was there was there was some there were some consequences gonzalo but the consequences were for joe wilson and valerie Plain. yeah that's right Remember they went they went after joe told the truth he said that there was a lie that was sold to the American people, and they they, they went out and destroyed him, and then they, they they ended up destroying Valerie. So if you're in government at that point, the message is loud and clear. If you wow. dare to tell the truth, they're going to yeah. get you. Jesus, JJ, does yep. that answer your question? Yeah, <clears throat> yes, that was an excellent answer. Um, also, what about the collapse of human intelligence and uh, tradecraft, and now yeah. the over reliance of uh, communications? Because uh, everything seems to have shifted that way, and there seem to be very few assets on the ground. Uh, I know in the US military they've got the activity, but you know, there seems to be a complete loss of networks. Can you talk about that? We actually covered that a little earlier. Yeah, and yeah, we, we did covered John. it a little earlier. But the question I have specifically about that issue is that when was the decision made not to cultivate human intelligence? Was it a specific decision, or did it sort of like peter out on its own? No, it developed over the years. You know, it it probably started at the beginning of the Clinton administration. Uh, yeah. The the CIA underwent something called a cull, where um, where the White House. Uh, told the CIA, we've got to fire every clandestine source that we have who has a, a, a problem with human rights, which was a, a noble thing to do. But um, but it, it resulted. Can you, can you expand on that? I don't, I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. So so let's say uh, you are uh, the leader of a death squad in yeah. Uh, in <laughs> okay. yeah in el salvador or nicaragua or whatever um no you uruguay fired. uruguay please because it's got better yeah weather. right <laughs> okay um, better beaches so the cia wasn't going to do business with you anymore so we're gonna oh. we're gonna cut you off we can't talk to you anymore because you're a human rights violator that's an that's a noble thing to do but if but you want stupid. information on what the other members of the death squad are doing yeah. Uh, then, you yeah. know, John McCain yeah. once said that it's difficult to be in business with pigs. Um, you're going to get dirty by rolling in the mud with the pig, but the pig enjoys it. So, you know, you've, you've got to make a decision, a, a policy decision about whether or not you're going to lay down with monsters. And well, in terms of like getting information, it would, it, I mean, right. uh, if your job is to get accurate information, yeah, you're going to have to, you, you can talk to saints, but you're going to have to talk to some demons too. A lot yeah, of demons. Exactly. Because the demons are the ones who are causing the trouble. It's not exactly. the saints, right? And, and so right. The, the notion that, oh, I'm not going to talk to you because you're a human rights abuser, abuser I, I don't see the practical uh, uh, benefit and I see a lot of practical detriments 
to uh, uh, self-censoring yourself because you're not going to know what horrible people are up to, which is the whole mm -hmm. point, isn't it? Well, yeah, and because the, the people you're, they were really targeting to recruit were anybody that had any connection to the Russians or to the Chinese uh, that were you know, working in diplomatic jobs. You know, you know, really, they CIA had a different, completely different cast of uh, assets compared to what DEA would get. Uh, mm -hmm. DEA yes. would actually, you know, you get some people that really knew what was going on, but they were. You know, usually they'd kill two or three people and they were drug traffickers. Uh, I think there was one other factor, though, that contributed to the movement away from human. Uh, it was in the early 1990s under Clinton that they started sending senior analysts overseas as chiefs of station. Yes. In other words, you, you would send somebody like the boss in my middle, middle America Caribbean division was a guy named Marty Rover. Well, Rober was a he was a character. He was a porn addict, among other things. You know, and they didn't 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 hide it at work. I mean, this is what was Oh sort of, God. Yeah, no, I mean there were I, I heard some conversations coming out of him. It was just like, you know, I'm thinking, you're doing this at work. But oh, God. He, he was sent, if he's doing that at work. Imagine what he was doing at home. Oh God. Yes. Yeah. So and then he winds up as the chief of station, uh, I believe it was Buenos Aires. He had never taken the field officer's training course. He had never served in a clandestine position overseas, really knew nothing about recruiting intelligence assets and then running them in a way to protect their identity. Sounds yet, like John Brennan. John yeah, yeah. Brennan. well, exactly, exactly. The, the same yeah. thing with Brennan. Sure. Yeah, yeah. He, he, had, he had never spent a single day in the Directorate of Operations, and he becomes the chief of station in Riyadh. Yeah, yeah. In Riyadh, and, of all places. Yeah, yeah, yeah and in yeah. fact, one of one of my one of my classmates was the chief of base out at Dahran when that was blown up. And one of the one of the backstories to that is they were prevented from collecting on any intelligence that would be terrorist related because they didn't want to offend the Saudis. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so he he was prevented from being able to collect information that probably could have uh, prevented that incident. And that was Bren JJ. Brennan signed off. Brennan signed off on that. Uh, JJ, uh, thanks for being on. I'm going to bring somebody else. Oh, thanks to you so much. Okay. For By the way, just finally, I'd like to say a great thank you to John Kiriakou. Oh, I know he's you. been through an, an enormous amount, and there's a lot of us out here that actually really appreciate what he's been uh, through. thank so, you so much. Thank you very much. That means best. a lot to me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, JJ. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, let me bring in. Um, uh, real quick, let me bring in the spy guy. The spy guy is, is called the spy guy. He runs a channel called the spy guy. Check him out. Hey, how's it going, spy guy? <laughs> great. This is great. Like uh, two people I would love to do an interview with kind of thing. Uh, uh, you guys have shown to me, I always thought the CIA was the sandbaggers, but you you make the abware look good from what you're calling me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so what's on your mind, man? Thank you. Yeah, just uh, I don't know. Do you have any favorites in, uh, in intelligence shows, or what do you think is really a realistic show? <laughs> That's a good question. Right. That's a good question. I, I, um, I, all the questions I wanted to ask, I had to come up with something out there, so I went with that one. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the best, the best um, intelligence-related show um, ever is The Americans. Okay. Absolutely really? the best. Yeah. And Joe Joe Weisberg, the, the creator of the Americans, I, I worked with him in the Counterterrorism Center. Fantastic guy, absolutely brilliant, complete and total failure as a case officer. It just wasn't for him. <laughs> he just he just didn't have it in him to ask people to commit espionage. And so he told me one one day that he was resigning. And I said, What really? I said, Oh man, I'm gonna be sorry to see you go. What are you gonna do? And he said, um, well, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. I'm going to go to Hollywood and find my fortune. And he wrote a, he wrote a novel that was well-received, but didn't do very well commercially. It was heavily redacted, which mm. I liked because it showed that he was serious about it. And then he created the Americans. And as successful as the Americans became, 
the CIA still insisted on reviewing and in many cases redacting the scripts to that show because they were really? just they were just too true to life. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, really? So they were involved in that. Now, in terms of movies, there was a movie that came out 20 years ago called The Recruit with like <laughs> or, Orlando Bloom or somebody. Uh, um, Pacino. The, Pacino was in it, wasn't he? Yeah, Pacino was in it. Exactly. The first half of that movie was 100 percent right on. And then the second half kind of went a little crazy. It was exactly on, except they didn't beat us in um, in training. I mean, training mm. was hard. It was very mm. hard. But they didn't beat us. Now, with that said, okay. I'm going to blow my own horn here. I'm the script consultant for a new show that's going to start in March on CBS called True Lies. It's based on the James Cameron movie of the same uh, name. This show is going to be awesome. It starts at the end of March. It's got a cast of young nobodies. And they're some of the most brilliant script writers I've ever met. Nice. Uh, that was Spy Guy. This I was like listening to your question. I'm like, oh, I don't know, but now you know, I want to see the show. <laughs> well, I, I I would weigh in with one of the problems with the agency and and Hollywood television movies is people their image becomes you know, Sean Connery, yeah, Pierce Pierce Brosnan, right. and the reality is I think captured by Scott Adams and his cartoon Dilbert. Dilbert is more, <laughs> the more appropriate image for the CIA. Indeed. I'll, I'll add one other thing too, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to take a piss on the, on the parade here, but um, over the last uh, 10 years or so, the CIA has opened up a branch within the um, office of public affairs whose employees jobs. It is to solely liaise with Hollywood studios. So, yeah. Oftentimes, most of the time, you're going to get only pro CIA programming coming out of LA. Sure. Yeah, which is you know not a good thing. That's not the case with True Lies, uh, but yeah. most most CIA related productions are just like the FBI related productions were in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where everything had to get the personal approval of J. Edgar Hoover. Fair enough. Spy Guy, I hope that answered your question, man. Yeah, uh, I will say, if you guys have not seen it, I would recommend watching The Sandbaggers. You can find them on YouTube. It is a great show from about British intelligence in the 70s, written by an ex-spy uh, himself. And uh, it, goes, it gets really into bureaucratic drama. So I, well, I'll I, leave that with you. I, I will say that my the show I like to watch and can watch over and over is the Le Carre Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, and uh, Spy yeah. People. Yeah. The British, the British version of it, not the not the American movie. Yeah, the Alec Guinness one. You can yeah. also yeah. find those on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much, Spy Guy. Take it easy. Bye. Yep. Bye. Uh, by the way, in insofar as finance is concerned, the best movie to watch about uh, an investment bank from the inside is Margin Call. And it was a uh, oh, yeah. movie a few yeah. years ago. That, yeah, that was absolutely the best uh, financial movie. That that gives you a sense, a real sense of what an investment bank is like. Um, I'm going to bring on Susie Q, who's a longtime supporter, and thank you so much, Susie Q, for being on. Hi, how are you? Hi there. Well, um, I, I I have what I have a couple of questions, but this one I'm not sure you may or may not want to answer. What happened to Gina Haspel? Oh, I know what happened to Gina Haspel. In fact, Who is I can Gina see, Haspel? from where I'm sitting, I, I, I can see the office <laughs> building where Gina Haspel works. She is now an uncredited investment advisor at a hedge fund <laughs> that's located at the corner of 17th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. She is not on the fund's website. And, and wow. so, she's, she's made, I, I, she's, I forgot, I, I forgot. She was she head was of the, CIA and she, oh, she was there was some, uh, yeah, there was some uh, concern that she was involved in some activities that happened over in Germany at the time of uh, the election. Well, she was, she was actually prior to that, she was the chief of station in London. So she was liaison for the whole Russiagate, uh, the involvement yeah, of British was. intelligence mm -hmm. with CIA and FBI. So she was actively involved in the plot against Trump. Yeah, yeah. yeah she was um, also one of the god the godparents of the CIA's torture program, infamously so. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So she was yeah. not on the side of the angels, as it were. Oh, no, no, no. No. No, in fact, you know what? I when she was named CIA director, the Washington Post called me and they asked if I would write an op-ed um, about her nomination as CIA director. I said absolutely. So they told me, take as many words as you want. We'll put it in on Sunday. So I wrote like fifteen hundred <laughs> words, and then they did a a video uh, interview to attach to the electronic uh, copy of the the uh, op-ed. Well, the day that it ran, I got a call from Rand Paul. And he said, can you come to my office and we strategize about how to block this woman's nomination? I said, absolutely. So I speed up to Capitol Hill, meet with Rand Paul and four or five of his aides. We spend a day strategizing. And then five days later, he voted yes on her nomination. Really? Why? Wow. Because the CIA told him to. Wow. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Chuck Schumer once said that uh, he said that if the C- if the intelligence agencies want to get you, they've got, uh, you know, seven ways to Sunday right. that, that they can yeah. do so. Yeah, he Are did. You he basically, said, they've, I mean, they've it, nine it, ways from Sunday. Yeah. yeah. Is it yeah. accurate Absolutely. to say you that know, the I, intelligence I, services basically are a blackmail the, the lawmakers so that they get their way? Is that an accurate statement? Yes. And it's not even blackmail so much as it is gray mail. You know, I, I, I went up to um, I went up to Senator Ron Wyden one time at a dinner party. I had just gotten out of prison and mm-hmm. I went up to him and I said, hey, Senator, I got to I got to say I was disappointed. I expected more from you. I thought you would support me more strongly than just, you know, one meaningless statement. And he got very angry and he said, look. It takes all of my energy just to not lose my security clearance. And I said, oh, really? so you're afraid of them. That's what it is. Wow. That's my yeah. senator. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Very yeah. disappointing. Seth. I live, uh, I live you... in the communist uh, area of uh, Oregon. So, yeah, that's quite <laughs> disgusting. Very <laughs> disgusting. So my next question um, what do you think will happen now that the Twitter files have come out and have shown that not only were the FBI, but the CIA, Homeland Security, now the Biden administration with the uh, malady and yeah, the medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And not no, just we, them. We, we, we want the- and, and that we not only that, the FBI paid Twitter three and a half million dollars to censor American citizens. Mm-hmm. What do you think yeah. will happen with that? Everything you've said is 100% true. And we're learning more and more about it every day no. thanks to uh, Elon Musk and Matt Taibbi and Barry Weiss. Um, and I hate to say, but I think nothing will happen. I think I nothing think so. will happen. Now, if I had a choice in this, I would say there have to be prosecutions. This is yeah. clearly... A, a first oh, yeah. amendment, yeah. first amendment yeah. constitutional violation, right? Clearly. Americans yeah. had their constitutional rights to freedom of speech uh, uh, curtailed at the insistence of the FBI, which is a governmental entity. So yeah. clearly, constitutional yeah. crimes were committed, and I think that yeah. I think that nobody cares, at yeah. least Sorry, not in you, this administration. Yeah, no, I. Well, I'll tell you what. We conservatives and Republicans, we care. We care a lot, and we're not happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the it, 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 is, it's important that the information is coming out to that it, to expose the fact that on every substantive issue that was in front of the U.S. government, the U.S. government was in active uh, collaboration with social media to lie to the American public. The, the, the reality is we have a nation now founded upon lie after lie after lie. It's being exposed, but, you know, it goes back to our earlier conversation about the lack of accountability. Nobody's being called on the carpet and held accountable for it because there are too many moneyed interests in this that are profiting from it. You know, but they're making money, you know, for the FBI personnel. Man, they got a golden parachute when they landed at Twitter and top jobs. That's, uh, you know, uh, yeah, 80, yeah. 80 FBI agents tasked with nothing but looking for troublemakers. Yeah. That is yeah. pathetic. And unfortunately, <laughs> Gonzalo got caught in that web. But um, I'll tell you what, 
if you send emails to like Twitter support and say, hey, can I get my account back? That is what's working for people, Gonzalo. And I've been oh, tweeting it out yeah. and tweeting it out. Yeah. So that's yeah, true. do that. Okay. That's yeah, true. I'll, that's I'll that's how I'll Garland Nixon one. was reinstated. Yeah. So yeah. Email and Twitter I, support. Okay. And hey, I think even Scott Ritter got put back on. So you've got to get on it. Okay. <laughs> Susie Q, thank you so much for being on. Oh, I'll you're welcome. You and it's good show. to see you again. All right. Thank bye you. bye. Lovely to see you too. Bye. Yeah, uh, yeah, because the, the whole Twitter thing, yeah, because the, the lists that are coming out, and also what, what's obvious to me is that, see, once you hire a bunch of people to start censoring them, you censor these people, and then you start censoring more and more and more to justify your existence until you censor everybody, until there's nobody left, basically. And, and so yep. it, it, it's just absurd. And the fact is that these social media platforms have de facto become the public square. And so yes. you really are censoring the people. Uh, and this notion that, oh, it's a private company, they can do whatever they want, you know, th that's actually not true. I mean, you, you can't censor people on the phone company and, and say, oh, we don't like your, your conversations on the phone, so we're going to deplatform you and not let you have a cell phone or a landline. I mean, it doesn't work that way. And so uh, the, the thing is, I find it deeply disturbing, but unfortunately, I think that, John, you're correct. They aren't going to do a goddamn thing at the end of the day. I no, mean, I don't think they will. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Well, anyway. the, the only, I think the only thing that will be done is what Elon's doing right now, eliminating the bots off the uh, off the yeah. platform, exposing the malfeasance. And it'll make it a little more difficult for them to use Twitter going forward. But, hey, they still have Facebook. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, they certainly do, especially now that Facebook is completely tanking because they made the yeah. wrong bets. But yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, it's it's something like there is this conspiracy theory, rumor, whatever that Elon Musk is like CIA or that he's connected. <laughs> I, I'm throwing this out there. You know, it's not something that well, I'm really. I you, you know, know I don't think I, I don't think he's CIA. I think it's more overt than that. The guy's got hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts with the CIA. Yeah. And with the NSA and the whole national security establishment. So, I mean, he's got a vested interest in making sure that the CIA is comfortable with whatever it is he does. How, how does he have business relationships with the CIA, by the way? And the NSA? Uh, cloud, uh, cloud computing. Cloud computing. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just you, like we're Facebook. talking about Elon Musk, right? Because Elon of, Musk. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Plus, I didn't you know, know that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a he's a serious uh, national security contractor. Oh. Okay, but, uh, go ahead, Dollar. Well, I just say, but it appears he has the advantage that the government needs him more than he needs the government. Good so point. Therefore, he's got some freedom to, to basically, you know, so if they don't want to use it, fine, I'll cut you off. Like he could, he could shut down the Ukrainian military tomorrow, turn off yeah. Starlink, they're done. Well, the Russians have done a pretty good job of that already. Uh, yes. From what I understand, the, the Russians have, have really clipped uh, Starlink, and it's not as functioning as it used to be. And uh, turning, uh, I, that was something that I wanted to bring you guys to, because um, you know we were talking about like there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, but since the administration, uh, the Bush administration, continued after this revelation, there were no consequences. Now it's very clear that the situation in uh, uh, Ukraine is deteriorating, and so far as the Zelensky regime's um, military is concerned, it's really just a meat grinder in Bakhmut. That is the major battle that is taking place here. And so I want to ask you: you know, eventually, the, the 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 Zelensky regime is going to collapse. This is sort of like inevitable. And so the question becomes: you know, once that collapse happens. Will there be any effects insofar as the intelligence community, or do you think that just the momentum and they'll just keep on rolling on? And I mean, will there ever be accountability, I suppose, is what I'm asking. Will there yeah. ever be, you know, something that the failure is so colossal that they, they have to stand still and take the, the, the justly deserved beating for their failures? Will that moment happen, or do you think that they'll be able to slide away from everything, even the mess that is being left here in Ukraine? Yeah, I, I think I think they will uh, try to blame it on Biden and uh, to, uh, ignore any any accusation that they were responsible or played any role in this. Uh, I mean, it, it is going to happen. 
uh, but the you know the the bureaucratic inertia i can't emphasize enough that the, the the size of this monster because it employs all these people and all these different hierarchies as long as they're drawing a paycheck and you show up to work and you don't rock the boat hey you live to survive another day yeah. and those uh the, the the sad truth about this is whoever's been leading this effort they'll probably get promoted yeah <laughs> you know, rewarded yeah. Yeah, they probably will. Are we going to have a Victoria Newland as the new vice president or something like that? God. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, yeah. you wish something would something would bring an end to these neocons. I mean, they've been the, 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 they are consistently wrong, and uh, yeah, on have been. Yeah. Yeah. And for twenty five you know, years. Yeah, it, it's just pathetic. But anyway, look, we've been going on for about an hour and a half. Uh, it's been a delightful conversation. But I want to draw it to a close because, you know, always leave on top. That, that's my, my motto. You know, there the secret you go. to a long life is knowing when it's time to go. And so I want to thank Larry and I want to thank John. And uh, guys, stick around a little bit. We'll, we'll just, uh, just uh, chat a little bit. Um, chat, do me a favor. And if you enjoyed the show, hit a plus one. If you hated it or didn't like either <laughs> of my guests or me, hit a zero. So, you know, we can get like instant democracy and, and we can know if, if people liked it or not. Plus one if you liked it, zero if you hated it. Uh, and there we go with a bunch of plus ones. Thank you so much, Chad. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Gentlemen, it's as always a pleasure to have you both on. It's just so much fun. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, to everybody, chat. I'll catch you next time. Take it easy.